Uh, good evening, everybody, and it's a real honor to be here tonight uh, as Hub AI and collaborating with AI2S. Um, it's our first webinar, so right now all I see are our panelists and none of you, which is a, a bit of a strange feeling, but still, welcome everyone. I hope you're comfortable and ready for a great discussion. Um, so Hub AI and AI2S decided to do a collaboration together, which means that we both equally uh, brought in speakers. So uh, Hub AI chose two speakers and AI2S uh, chose another two. So I'm going to present Hub AI speakers. Uh, so our first one is uh, Joaquim Malgarejo Rica. <laughs> it's not a mouthful at all. Um, yeah, so uh, Joaquim, uh, graduated from the Universidad Carlos de Madrid Telecommunication, <laughs> gracias, uh, engineering, and uh, received a master's degree in data knowledge from Université de Paris Seclin. Seclin, very cool. Uh, Harry, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's a, uh, and you now work at uh, Telefonica, where you are the core delivery team manager, uh, and you look at projects related to big data and AI. So you're much more involved in, uh, like, let's say, in the practical aspect, although you also lecture. And then our second speaker is uh, Stefan Larsen, who is a senior lecturer and associate professor in technology and social change at Lund University. Uh, you can see Lund University behind him. It's that beautiful. Everyone should visit. <laughs> um, and uh, so Stefan holds an NN an LLM, so Masters in Law, as well as a PhD in uh, Sociology of Law and a PhD in Social Planning. Um, so a bit of everything. And uh, Stefan also does a course specifically on smart city governance, uh, looking at AI and ethics. So, uh, so those are our speakers. Uh, they should bring in some very good points uh, to smart cities and sustainability and uh, yeah we look forward to hearing more i'll now pass it over to andrea uh, yes can you hear me yes very well <laughs> okay so i'm andrea gasparin the president of the ai2s the artificial intelligence student society of trieste and uh the speakers that we brought at the table of this panel discussion are eric metvet is an associate professor in computer engineering at the University of Trieste, founder of the Evolutionary Robotics and Artificial Life Lab, co-founder and uh, co-chief uh, of the Machine Learning Lab, both in Trieste, and his research fields concern evolutionary computation, artificial life and its applications, machine learning and computer security problems. And then we have Stefano Cozzini, who has a PhD in physics and currently is the director of Research and Technology Institute of Vara Science Park, which is a, a huge research um, center in the northeast of Italy. He has been the coordinator of several research infrastructure projects uh, at national and international level. And in the last few years has been working for various scientific communities on the application of machine learning and advanced data science on top of computational infrastructures and also is a professor who teaches a, a performance, uh, high performance computing for the data science um, course uh, in uh, Trieste. I'll immediately straightforward pass um, along the word to Eric Metford to start the actual discussion. And I will thank everyone to be here to attend to this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Leticia, for the introduction. Um, I am very happy and honored to be here to start uh, this panel with a discussion on such relevant topics. And for this, I, I thank uh, the organizers, in particular the two associations. So what are, which are these uh, very re relevant topics? One is sustainability. What is sustainability? We can see sustainability as uh, something concerning the maintainability over the time of a policy, an action, or condition, and maybe not just over the time, also over in over the space in a broader sense. Okay, uh, so sustainability can be seen as a form of fairness. Is a good thing that we are enjoying here and now also enjoyable in the future by other subjects, maybe in other areas of the world or other kinds of subject subject. 
On the other end, we have uh, smart cities. Uh, smart cities are where the technology serves the people, where the people is crowded more densely. Okay, so the central, let's say, um, the, the, uh, uh, um, very central point in our civilization. Um, so we have sustainability and smart cities, and there is an interplay between th these two things. Sustainability, uh, uh, sorry, smart cities could be, in principle, a way to achieve sustainability since it is smart, okay? On the other hand, when we design and build our smart cities, we should aim also at sustainability. So this should be something, an attribute that should be seek, should be uh, looked for by designers. And there is also a third player. Since smart is a property usually associated with intelligence, uh, and since a way to have a scalable intelligence is to have an automatic, so artificial intelligence, of course, there is an obvious uh, connection between smart, smart cities and artificial intelligence. So we have these big three topics that impact potentially billions of people now and in the future, and maybe not only people, maybe other creatures, maybe creatures that today form the environment, animals, trees, plants, but also not only biological creatures. Okay, In some sense, this AI that we want to exploit to have smart cities could be a creature. And maybe we could and should look at it or at them as creatures. So fortunately, I'm not alone uh, trying to face uh, all these big topics. We have a panel of very uh, expert uh, um, uh, of uh, people, very experts on these topics, uh, uh, coming from different domains. So uh, hopefully with different points of view. Um, and I'm uh, uh, glad to uh, work uh, with them, with uh, Joaquin, Stefano and Stefan for uh, trying to, let's say, face this big uh, challenge of discussing these topics. Uh, I would start uh, just to warm up with a simple question that I would like uh, to to um, forward to uh, Joaquin eh? about what are, uh, in your vision, what are the current AI applications that are useful for having smartness in cities, so that are building blocks for smart cities? And do you think that we are already thinking about sustainability when using, designing, and 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 let's say, uh, maintaining these uh, AI, AI based uh, structure things or whatever. Okay, so first of all, thanks for the question. Thanks for having me here. It's a great opportunity for me. And I'm very honored and pleased to share this panel with all four of you, Stefano, Stefan, and Larry. Thanks for, very much. And uh, thanks you for, thank you for uh, launching me the first question. Although it's not easy to break the ice, I think it's a very, very interesting subject. So, First of all, I would like to um, give some overall details or overall facts about sustainability in cities. Not, not just speaking about smart cities, but cities in general. So approximately uh, city, the world cities account for 3% of land, earth occupation, land occupation. So within the map, it only uh, accounts for 3% of the total region occupied. But at the same time, it accounts for around 60 to 80 percent of waste uh, and consumption uh, energy water uh, there's a from that there's a around a 20 percent uh, waste direct direct waste and seven and they're also accountable for 75 percent of uh, carbon emissions so i would like to go back to what you just said before should we have in mind sustainability when thinking about smart cities not only we should, but it's a responsibility for us. I mean, given the fact that we already are polluting, uh, already creating this amount of waste, all this amount of uh, consumption, we should bear in mind that any kind of uh, initiative around smart cities uh, should have a green uh, axis in order to work with it, okay? Uh, there are some examples all over the world, and I mean, there are, and there are a lot of ex uh, examples throughout the globe uh, of what is a good smart city or what is a reference uh, smart city. For instance, one of my favorites, it's uh, Stockholm because it's, uh, they've already implemented so many projects. But I'm going to give you uh, three examples. Uh, first of all, I, I will use one of home uh, here in Spain, Barcelona. 
and I'm sorry if I'm a little biased, but first of all, we need to, to discuss about uh, one of the greatest pollutants. The greatest pollutants, it's cars, obviously, and uh, throughout uh, some AEI uh, initiative uh, here in Barcelona, uh, there's a, a revenue increase uh, for um, th what they done is they, they, they applied an artificial intelligence in order to reduce or make more availability zones for parking zones. You may think that this is not really mm, re directed or related to uh, sustainability in this sense, but what it does is although there's a big revenue for, for them in terms of uh, parking fees, around 50 million per year, it also accounts for a 10% uh, decrease in waste management because of the strategic points of this parking uh, um, or, um, position. At the same time, in another small city here in, in Spain called Gento, Gencho, sorry, uh, along with Ferrovial, which is a, a multinational company here in Spain also, what they've done is they've done a smart distributed waste uh, disposal. So they, ha they have not only scheduled uh, the, the garbage plan and the garbage the, the garbage truck disposals, but also what they've done is they, they have sized and they have included smart containers in order to make it more dynamic. So not only you're talking about scheduling, which in the fact reduces its self consumption because there are not so many trucks in order to, to deploy, but there also there's a there's an intelligence applied to the, um, to the um, to the waste disposal itself. And finally, one of the best examples I think here is something that we don't really think about, but it really accounts for a lot of, uh, of our taxpayers' money is smart lightning. Uh, in particular, in Providence, in the USA, uh, the city, uh, what they've done is they've, they've implemented that smart lightning uh, system. And only because of that, they've, uh, what they've done is they, they've smart, they've, they've, they've implanted 15,000 uh, smart posts around the, the city. And this has accounted for 73% of energy consumption, uh, uh, energy, energy um, cost saving. So they, they've already reduced 73% of their total consumption in electricity, which is huge uh, throughout the year. And at the same time, uh, this accounts for approximately 400 trucks of uh, uh, trucks that, uh, that don't get sent through and don't waste uh, in this kind of thing. So every little thing that we might implant as a use case, as an, as an example, in any kind of smart city, there's a like, green impact. There's something that we need to think otherwise. I mean, when you think about smart lighting or you think about uh, intelligent parking, you don't really think about uh, how it's going to affect the, the ecosystem. And I'm sorry if I'm taking too much space uh, or time in this. I'm very sorry for Stefan and Stefano. But my overall point here is that with every single use case, there's a green access to it. So therefore we should, um, we should always keep this in mind in the ecological end. Okay, thank you very much, Joaquin. Um, as I understand, you mentioned a few examples that are pretty uh, nice because they are exactly uh, designed to be uh, for sustainability. Uh, so probably in those cases, the, 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 the goal of sustainability was a primary goal, probably the main goal. Uh, are you aware, uh, maybe from your point of view, um, as a person working in industry, are you aware of cases in which apparently there is a smart something, but at the end it was not sustainable? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, for instance. I, I am recently working, um, I'm currently working on an IoT um, solution. It's not directly related to smart cities, but it, it has an ecological impact. So I will use this as an example. And uh, these are intelligent containers and reefers. Uh, you know that these huge containers that get traveled and get transported through sea, uh, they, due to the nature of, the, of this kind of business, uh, what they do is that they, these containers travel two to three times a year, and they go from one point of the globe to another. Um, at the beginning, or let's say uh, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, there was no real intelligence to it, uh, just to the fact that they, you have a guy in every port in the world just accounting for the, for the containers. 
and you don't really have a, the sense of how much you are displacing, how much you are cons how much consumption there is, because you have maybe a, a container half full or something like that. There was no real control uh, on a on a global scale. So the business uh, access to this project was in order to uh, add some sensorics and networking to these containers and, and these reefers uh, in order to gain some optimization, cost optimization, uh, and working, activating uh, distantly the, the containers because there's something related to the to the freeze chain and so on and so forth. And all of this was, uh, uh, this was um, obtained through uh, implanting some uh, IoT this, um, uh, machines in each of every containers and each of, of every uh, in every boat in order to to have an ecosystem completely connected. The green impact here was that I don't really know the the, um, the percentages very well, but I mean there's a 50 to 60 percent reduction in fuel consumption uh, based on every container. Why? Because now you have a complete control of where every asset is. Uh, you don't need, uh, there's a, a reduction uh, in the cost of fuel saving for every employee of the company because there's no need for a guy to go to check every single container around the world. And this is a guy maybe uh, taking a trip, uh, not only by car, by plane uh, to, to every single port in the world in order to check about this. Uh, you have a much better control uh, about your interests, about all your uh, assets. Therefore, there is a green impact, although you don't see it. I mean, when you when you do this kind of business cases, what you do is you think about in terms of uh, revenue, in terms of return of investment, investment. But there's not really you, you cannot quantify the, the green impact and the and the, the derived cost or the 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 the, um, the things that you can absorb because of a reduction in the in the pollutants or in the the fuel consumption and this was one of the best surprises that there was related to this project okay thank you very much other comments from stefano and stefan maybe about uh let's say unsuccessful application of uh ai to smart cities maybe in terms of sustainability A brief comment, uh, like a meta comment. I think that um, um, uh, one point here is, I mean, in, in the, there is traditional sustainability discourse, and it's mainly focused ecological, so like the environmental aspects of that. But uh, what I find interesting uh, when it comes to AI, uh, sort of the main awareness creation has been around more on social sustainability. So the fairness issues on you know, how does it, you know, affect humans? Uh, is it uh, biases uh, built into it that we don't detect uh, until it's too late? Or is it like, does it may it even have discriminatory effects uh, passing undetected? How transparent, you know, all of these stuff that's not so much on the ecological end, but more on the social end. I think that's a just fair sort of early statement here to, to note that. Uh, but then, uh, and you mentioned that also in your opening, of course, there is like a material side to AI, uh, uh, very much so when it comes to energy consumption and maybe, you know, server halls and, and the use and the need of infrastructure. And that costs something too. I think that that sort of awareness is gaining traction now. I think we will see more like a research funding towards green AI and sort of EU commission pointing in that direction. But interestingly enough, I think that narrative is step two uh, where, you know, where, where's the sort of social, the fairness aspect was step one in a sense uh, during the last few years. Uh, I think that's an interesting sort of different sort of dynamics to it. Okay, I, I take the freedom to uh, build up a question from, from this comment. Uh, this is something that I, I wanted to, to discuss about. Um, so we saw that uh, um, designers of cities, okay, let's say government, local governments, or national governments, or even larger uh, kinds of governments, can decide to, to design for sustainability also by uh, employing artificial intelligence. But as you said, often this can be done because they exploit a sort of technological gap, okay? They have resources, so nations, cities, have resources that maybe other nations, other cities don't have. 
these resources, we will talk about them maybe later, are material resources, uh, data centers, energy, uh, even uh, skills and knowledge that can can uh, they can access to because they have good university or something like that. Uh, not only uh, on the side of the designers of AI, but also on the side of the consumers of AI. Okay, so uh, here my question is: Who should be in charge of evaluating the broad impact of an improvement, a technological improvement, maybe affecting a city? Uh, beyond the local effect okay beyond the fact that i'm providing a good service to my city at, at which cost for other cities or maybe other nations who, who should be in charge of that uh stefan that's a huge question isn't it i mean uh, it's hard to avoid um, uh, geopolitics also in that i mean um, also well recently i've been looking at um ethics guidelines for AI and sort of the regulatory ideas of AI. And, and, and then when you look at that, you realize this, the diff, there, there are differences in the narratives in the US and versus the Europe uh, or the Chinese, for example. So uh, the movements in those different parts of the world will be very different and they have uh, uh, pointing to different approaches. So it's hard to, but they also compete, right? So this is also like a global competition. And I think that when you ask who should be the evaluator, I don't know. It's a, it's a global competition going. Uh, and maybe sometimes to mention it, when we look at uh, the benefits or the improvements that we can get, uh, this uh, also like a global uh, imbalance or uh, injustice in that, okay, there are the rich countries versus the not so rich countries. And it tends to be like the, the global north that, 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 that reaps the benefits. Sometimes even the same sort of structures being built on, on the resources from the, from the poorer parts of the world, which is like a, the mines in, in Congo uh, support the, you know, the really nice Teslas of, uh, of uh, uh, Stockholm or something like that. So, so there are injustices in that sense too. I think it, it needs to be pointed to, but who, who should be evaluating that overall? I don't know. There's not one simple answer to it, I think. Yeah, I agree. It's a huge question. <laughs> um, okay, so let, let's uh, go back to uh, things that are probably not so huge. One, one of those uh, kinds of resources uh, for which there are differences, okay, so different opportunities is, uh, as I said, energy, okay. In particular for AI, uh, maybe a lot of, um, maybe people, let's say the general public say, ignore the fact that AI uh, cost takes a lot of energy. Um, Stefano, can you, can you tell us and comment on what are the main sources of energy consumption when we deal with AI? Well, energy is actually a great, a great problem. Now, nowadays, IT in the whole, I mean, actually account for quite a huge uh, fraction, huge means uh, order of uh, few percentage, but I mean, just for IT is actually huge and this is actually growing. So I mean that every IT staff, even our uh, webinar today is actually consuming energy. And uh, it looks like that it is, it's so easy to do that because we are not traveling. Unfortunately, we are just in our office, but energy is actually consumed. And uh, training and using uh, IE model on a very large data set consumes a lot of energy, of course. Uh, and it's actually quite, uh, quite a, a, an, important, uh, an important aspect to consider. So actually, it's not actually so smart to, to, to spend a lot of energy just to predict something that can be actual, that uh, I mean, uh, how to predict, how to save energy. If you spend so, many, so much energy to save 1% of energy, if you spend 5% uh, of energy in predicting uh, the saving, no, or in, in trying to understand, to, to, to save this uh, small amount of energy. So this is actually for sure, a very important point. Uh, I have to say in any case that uh, uh, these high performance computing uh, resources that you need to do uh, to do and to train this uh, huge uh, uh, algorithm and uh, on this huge data set are actually improving very well in the sense that actually the technology 
is improving and so the demand if in energy is getting uh, is decreasing with respect to the power okay so this is actually something that we saw in the last few years uh, and um, in the last let's say 10 years uh, the energy um, energy is on the agenda of people that are doing data centers also and so, so it's important and they, and there are some smart behavior okay that can minimize the energy. So for instance, uh, recycling energy, the hot uh, uh, free, uh, taking, taking action to, to, to take away the amount of, uh, of heat generated by the system. And this actually creates some funny, fun, uh, some funny stories. For instance, you know, Facebook has a huge data center that is actually uh, cooled down by a lake. At a certain point, the lake actually increased the, 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 the temperature. Okay, so the, the water in the lake increased the temperature of, of a few a few degrees, and uh, it changed a little bit the ecosystem, the ecological system over around there. And so again, a huge impact that is not so easy. Uh, it's, it's, it's not so easy detectable on a short range scale, but on a long range scale. That could be some important thing, but that even the smartest idea that you apply to save energy and so to reduce the impact can have on the on, on our system. So this is actually quite complicated, quite a complicated situation because sometimes you have things that you think that are smart now and there and are not at all smart tomorrow and over there. So that's another complicated stuff. So again, we are, which kind of sustainability should, have, should we look for? Are we, sh shall we be, shall, shall we try to be as green as possible or shall, shall we try to be as smart as possible also in what we are doing? And so the question is actually, do we really need this or not? That's actually the point. So a little bit of uh, attention to the to, to, to this uh, to this point. Okay, and uh, so energy is for sure important, but uh, it's not the only parameter that actually can decide if uh, as if uh, an action is smart enough. That's actually the point. Taking into account that for sure it's important to reduce uh, the, the the energy that we are consuming in this. Uh, there are um, a few, not even particularly recent, let's say, facts or figures about energy consumption of AI. Just to give an idea, um, uh, someone uh, calculated that um, in five years ago, so for with our eyes of today's a small machine learning model uh, for uh, working with images, so computer vision basically took uh, an amount of energy which is to be trained, which is equivalent to the entire uh, life energy consumption of a gas-powered car. Okay, so a big, a big thing. Okay, we usually associate gas-powered car with uh, pollution, with uh, damage to the environment. On the other end, on the other end, we might think that a better computer vision model, possibly in um, uh, a driverless car can save lives, okay? So we replace the human driver making errors and possibly killing people with a computer that thanks to this improved computer vision model is no more killing people. So uh, basically we are, the, the problem of sustainability is that it's a multi-objective optimization problem in which we do not know the weight of the objectives, okay? In particular, because the core of sustainability is about the future, okay? We don't know the weight of uh, the objective related to the future or related to other things. We can reason about environment today, maybe environment in a couple of tens of years, but we cannot reason very precisely about centuries or even uh, about uh, uh, creatures for which we do not uh, to, to which we do not give right today, but maybe in the future we will think that they have the right to live in some way or so. So that's, uh, of course, a huge problem. It's a matter of weight. Uh, so uh, let's go back to uh, smart cities and, and uh, explain the fact that we are talking about uh, driverless car. 
mo mobility in general is often associated with uh, smart cities because mobility is one of the main activities of people, in particular in a smart city. Um, is this an opportunity or is this, a, 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 let's say, um, an art thing uh, for uh, AI um, in terms of sustainability? Uh, Stefan, what's your point of view? Both. Uh, to give the short answer, I think um, to me, I mean, not being the one developing cars, but sort of trying to understand the impact of them uh, from a you know, societal perspective. I think it's uh, with all these concepts, it's important to try to unpack them, what, what they mean. So when we talk about smart, uh, smartness can mean many things. Uh, autonomous cars, how should we view them? Yeah, well, of course, there are aspects like uh, in, in, in the, with security aspects of driving, like for like your example, but there are also, if you read, uh, I mean, uh, I just read a book uh, called AI in the Wild, trying to using um, um, more like a systemic approach on, okay, what does it mean that we continue the route of everyone should have a car, right? you know? Not challenging the fact that the car industry is sort of path dependent in that and the sort of the econo economic structure around cars are also path dependent in order to fund that development everyone should buy a car which is sort of that's that, that premise is very unsustainable uh, so trying to unpack you know what it means so even if there are benefits to the individual cars uh, you could uh, you could uh, find many of those benefits but there are still sort of you know, taking a step back and overlook the system and maybe see maybe there's flaws in the entire sort of setting here. We should have, we should re reduce the amount of cars and we don't have to own each and every one. We maybe should just travel, you know, commute or travel jointly or in a more, you know, the, the systemic arrangement of stuff. So I think that uh, that's important to me too. I think that's important to unpack it, not just buy it like, because uh, uh, because otherwise we would not be able to, find a new path to follow and uh, we would just continue on this sort of the way we used to do it and 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 that would not and that seems to be a very unsustainable actual actually you know path ahead so i think that's an important thing to unpack the meaning and challenge it in a sense yeah thank you there is, there is a way of saying that we do not need driverless cars we need uh, carless drivers okay so the, we could interpret this as, um, as a suggestion that we should maybe uh, forget uh, for a while the idea of using uh, the smart attri attribute of things, but we should uh, think again to the goal, to the final goal. Okay, so the final goal is to move around in a city. Maybe we just don't need so many cars. Uh, who is in charge of taking this decision? Should we uh, go for smart or not, Stefano? In particular for mobility. Yeah, I mean, this is actually a quite a quite good point. Actually, what what you mentioned, Eric, the the, the phrase that you mentioned is actually quite right. I, actually, we can think to be smart. In, I mean, we can think to have a smart cities that improve actually the the the, the overall car movement. We have to take out of, of our cities at least the, the western city, in which I mean, all the cities like the Italian one are also. Uh, the, the Spanish one. We have to take our. We, we have to take. I mean, the smart move is actually to take out the cars from the cities and not just uh, to find a way how to they can move around uh, in, in in streets that are not actually thought for them. So that's actually the, the very much important point. And here there are no way that uh, artificial intelligence can help because artificial intelligence actually can train model on a large data set. And if you take the look at the large data set, for instance, let, let's mention just the Trieste that is a small town floated, uh, actually floated by cars, okay? We have a lot of cars here and a very few bicycles, okay? And so if we train a model uh, asking to learn from the behavior of people that are moving around Trieste, they would come out that we will try to optimize the car movement because I mean, the data are actually based on car, but this is actually not the right solution because the right solution should be actually to train a model in which other forms of uh, other way of mobility can, can, take, can, 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 can take over the cars. And so this is a little bit complicated. Who is in charge of this? Well, smart uh, administrator or smart, uh, smart uh, major or smart whatever, that is actually quite complicated again, because I mean, we can think about smart cities if we don't 
if we don't uh, couple uh, them, if we if we, if we don't have a smart administrator, and unfortunately enough, actually, I have to say that uh, at least looking around here in Italy, there are quite a few of them smart. A lot yeah, of administrators, and but quite a few smart and with the, the right vision. Okay, I mean, I mean, I, I was really I was really in, mm, interested by the. Paris project in which the smart city, I mean, all the activity of smart cities there start from the idea that the town and the city actually, because uh, uh, Paris is quite large, should be actually that least a quarter of time around. So you can find everything, school, uh, uh, grocery, uh, urban transportation within a 15 minutes uh, walk. Okay, and you should be able to do that. This means actually that mobility is actually done in a way and is in, 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 actually partitioned around, around, around the town. You don't have to move too far to find your job, to find your place where you, you, you can find something to buy, unless in, in the majority of your movement, in the majority of your moves. And so this actually means a smart approach. Smart approach that actually can then be coupled and can be enforced by uh, smart, uh, uh, smart uh, algorithm, uh, artificial intelligent algorithm that can calculate better a lot of other stuff. But we have to start from the very beginning to be smart us as, uh, uh, let's say, uh, urban, um, I mean, as administrator to, to improve this. It's not just, uh, we, we can't, uh, we can't uh, think, uh, I mean, my idea is actually that we can be we can't have a smart cities without having a smart approach to them. By yeah, probably, the probably to have a smart administrator, administrator, you need smart citizens. Uh, in, in that, that's right. another. That's <laughs> another. That's another question. So there is a, a part. There is a, a clear uh, call for action. Let's say this way for everybody of us uh, in order to promote uh, safe and, and clean and important and uh, smart uh, behaviors. But again, the real change comes when somebody starts discussing and start promoting a clear change in the way our cities are, are, are managed. OK, now um, uh, this uh, suggests me a question. Suppose that we want to make our, our suppose that we, mo we want to make ourselves, uh, so the citizens, smarter in general. OK, one way to do that it's a very um, uh, weird idea, but one way to do that, and this is a provoking and weird idea, is to use a smart assistant, okay? Uh, many of us has, have a smart assistant. Uh, suppose that our smart assistant starts saying, please don't use the car, use the bike, okay? Every day. So this could be a, let's say, uh, a pretty uh, uh, invasive way of using a smart assistant. And despite the fact that there is the final goal of sustainability, this could be seen as a violation of privacy. That is one of the hot topic in, in, uh, in uh, let's say, artificial intelligence. Okay, there is this thing, the artificial intelligence suggesting me choices. Is it good or not? Okay, we accept that if we have to decide which is the movie that we are going to uh, look at in, uh, someday or which is the music the music that we are going to listen but should the the ai uh, give suggestion at this point of private life even if there is the sustainability goal after that uh joaquin do you have uh an opinion on this um my first opinion is that whenever you have a, a virtual assistant that give gives you this kind of emphasized recommendation is not really a a virtual assistant, but a, a virtual boss in the sense. But other than that, uh, yes, I, I believe that there's a transition. Uh, we are living in a transition period where we are uh, crowded by recommendation systems from um, a serious recommendation point of view to a lot of our choices in our daily lives. For instance, if you have a, uh, any kind of app uh, that gives you a certain variety of choices, there's always going to be a recommendation for you. So there are some aspects of our privacy that we've already, um, we've already given away in order for a benefit. For a, for a benefit. 
for instance. Uh, we can take the extreme case, the really, really, really extreme case of the United States and not judging, uh, but they renounce or the, the, they have given away a lot of their freedom, a lot of their uh, privileges in terms of security uh, within this uh, national security uh, law enforcement in order to protect. Uh, so actually in the United States and in many other countries, but I, I would like to stick to, to this example, they've already given up so much uh, just uh, be on behalf of this excuse or, be of, of, or this uh, example as a national security. So this is a transition that has been going along for a couple of years now, not only today, but I would say since we are interacting with, uh, with, uh, with intelligent systems or, or we have an, since we have a smartphone, since we have a personal computer, because we are, or we are always giving something away uh, in, in return to, to a certain benefit. Uh, the certain benefits here are mostly business opportunities uh, they, are, they are, for instance, this uh, this uh, choose this this recommendation of a, of a Netflix, Netflix movie. Uh, uh, what should you eat, or so on and so forth. So this is merely like a one step uh, in order to uh, to get to the next level. Uh, if you ask me, you are always entitled to, to your own opinion, given the fact that you can have a virtual assistant. That can say, okay, don't use the car today. Uh, please go ahead and, and use a, another transportation system. I believe that you, as a user, will always have the right to um, to to choose. And already your phone, I mean Google, Apple, whatever you you have, uh, they already know where your car is parked. They already know how much uh, time do you use to commute. How do you uh, dwell from one place to another? So really. There's there's no privacy uh, challenge here because we have we've already given that away. We uh, in exchange of, of having a smartphone, we already have this. The, the only repercussion here is that we are going we are getting some feedback uh, in this sense. So there's actually no for me uh, there's actually no challenge here. But what we need to do as citizens and what we need to do as as people is to understand this. Where are we able, or where do you, where do we believe that we need to draw the line in terms of the recommendation? And it's uh, purely uh, as a fact, as a matter of how much data I'm giving away, okay? Because we're already giving this data away, uh, and that's why they are able, businesses, governments, whoever, they are able to build the recommendation systems. So actually, what we need to think more, in my opinion, here is where do we draw the line in in data sharing. I don't know if this answers more the, the question or, or if I've completely changed the, the subject. No, no, it, it is in the in the in the topic. Um, so one thing uh, one thing that you say is that we should uh, uh, leave the possibility, leave the choice to the to the single individual, to the person to draw that line. But is that individual able to draw that line? Uh, can he or she understand uh, the context? Uh, if if we think about the European regulation, in particular about the uh, very renowned GDPR, uh, the practical effect is that we are clicking a lot of times, okay, 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 in uh, websites, okay. Uh, so are we doing well, in particular in Europe, concerning uh, this uh, need for transparency, fairness, and accountability? Uh, of usage of our data, AI, and so on. Stefan. Oh, thanks. I wanted this question. Uh, um, no, I think I think we're at the core of a question here. Uh, and when, when all of these questions, I'm thinking like unpacking and awareness. So uh, now we're down at the individual awareness level and, uh, and you point to some stuff with the GDPR. Uh, and for example, last year I did, I did a, a web-based third-party cookie tracking study. So just mapping third-party cookies on web pages. And, and of course, as we all know, there's lots of uh, third parties present. Uh, and as we also sort of have a feeling is that the consumers or us as users don't see that. We, we have no way to really be aware of who's there and what they're doing. Um, and in some sectors, there are more so. But uh, and the way that it's been regulated is like to ask and then ask us over and over and over and over and again. And, and that doesn't really 
make us more aware in that sense. That becomes just a nuisance in a sense. So I think that any regulatory system set up to single-handedly lean on individual awareness and choice making is bound to fail. Uh, so we need more structural sort of ways to see it, structural ways to have supervision authorities to look at, yeah, this is an unfair uh, uh, business practice. Uh, these may be okay because they're more in line with what we can assume the consumers want. So I think that um, we need to have this sort of structural um, approach to things. Uh, and I think uh, as with the other questions, uh, from my point of view, the, the question would be for whom is this done? So, so uh, I think that, uh, we, I mean, it's not a binary question in the sense that we don't want recommendation systems, like right? because they can do so many good things and we need them to, to merge the information sort of overflow of stuff. Uh, like, like how a search engine works. We need it. It's a great sort of a great idea to match information with, with my tiny queries. It's just that when it becomes a business out of it, that a question still should be for whom, you know, is it the relevancy is the relevancy out of information or is it out of matching, um, yeah, like, uh, ad ads on a market, uh, ad market, mar ad market, or is it something else? Like if we have an Alexa, would it be treating my purposes or would it be like, it has incentives to recommend stuff that Amazon produces, right? So for whom is always sort of the core, the purpose of the recommendation in a sense. So we need to be, be better at being aware of that, you know? So, cause otherwise we wouldn't understand why the recommend, if it's skewed in some sense, we could never see it. We, we have to know the sort of purpose of any recommendation. But I still think that the question the years ahead would be how do we how do you develop tools that uh, in a better way can be aligned with individual choices of you know the purpose so I don't get 500 questions I get three questions and I say yes I want to be healthy I want to bike more I, I, I care about the environment and then make me sort of nudge me in those directions as opposed to a hidden sort of purpose of you know match ads on markets I don't even know about or like sell stuff that's in, in, in a, another company's interest and not sort of my, you know, sort of tricking me to buy stuff too much maybe. So I think that, the, you know, the purpose of figuring out for whom is sort of at the core of any of these sort of learning recommendation systems. Uh, and I think that it's not necessarily saying that, that the gear would be the boss, like Joaquin said, just it's more like uh, we need to figure out ways to to make them echo my values in a sense. And then they sort of nudge me in the direction I choose in a sense. That would be, uh, that's, that's would be a more sustainable and, and a, a sort of a responsible way to use AI or recommendation systems in that sense. Okay, thank you. So I, I agree that if we add an AI that is aligned with our values, we, we could, we could uh, decide uh, uh, to which degree we want to comply with the suggestions. But this means that we are able to provide, to produce an AI that gives motivation uh, behind uh, the reasoning that uh, resulted in a suggestion. Stefano, are current techniques able to do this? And what, what is the path to an explainable AI? That's, that's an topic in AI research. Yeah, uh, probably, I mean, I, I can give you just just, just a partial, uh, as a partial answer, for sure. I mean, there is a lot of activity and understanding uh, this kind of stuff and uh, being sure that uh, you can build an uh, AI system able to, to better feel with that. Still, I think that uh, we are enough, uh, far enough, far enough from a, from, a, from a decent results. There are topical data, there, there are, uh, they are taking in, in the, there are group, research groups that are taking uh, input from, from external from external situation in order to deal a little bit with the problem that Stefan and, uh, mentioned, so sort of that. Uh, I'm not such an expert to, 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 to tell you that there are something that we will see soon, so I'm, I'm still looking around and trying to understand this. And so this is actually my, my partial and limited question answer to your question. I would like, however, to make a comment on again on this uh, on this smart cities and uh, smart cities and data privacy because this is actually another important point. Uh, 
we focus so far on the fact that, uh, I mean, a recommendation system that is actually my personal choice can be done or not, and we already discussed this. The point is now that smart cities actually, uh, there are actions that are considered smart, for instance, safety of the towns or, or cleanness of the town that actually, no matter who are you, they record your data, they record what you're doing, they record your behavior. And the question here is again, is this safe enough? Is this fair enough? Is this really inclusive for everybody or not? That's actually the point. And again, I think uh, I'm coming back to what I was saying before on mobility, again, on safety, because I, I mean, I, I think again, that all this solution, uh, all this solution that things to that uh, are considered smart for safety in town, I'm actually uh, very much uh, concerned about the fact they are not at all social sustainable. And again, we are thinking that uh, security and se security more than safety, sorry, because in Italy, in, in, in English, there is a, a clear di 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 um, distinction. Security, actually smart solution for security I don't think that an artificial intelligence system and more continuous monitoring with a lot of IoT stuff, with a lot of cameras all around that are taking photo and video and what everything is doing is actually so smart and so sustainable from a social point of view. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, here, one key point is that uh, before we were discussing about, uh, let's say, two actors, okay, the, 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 the uh, basically the individuals and a big, possibly a big company providing a service for in change of some data of the individuals. But here there is a, a, a third actor, which is the government itself, okay, that decide to, to decide to give some value to the data and just to, to, to obtain it. Maybe because if the government thinks that there is a, a return for for this uh, for taking this data, and and of course this is a difficult point because uh, there are cases in which and, and this is particularly uh, relevant now because since of uh, because of the pandemic, many governments decided to lower the bar to lower the bar concerning privacy. Okay, for the purpose of reducing the risk of spreading of the disease, but then who knows what is the outcome of those decisions. And that's a, that's a big point, um, which of course we cannot solve by ourselves. Uh, just a comment, I see that there are uh, questions arising in the Q&A uh, tool, okay? Uh, I'm keeping an eye on them. I, I have the feeling that some of those questions have been already addressed in, in the discussion up to now. However, we we have uh, um, a couple of uh, minutes more to discuss, let's say, freely before attacking the list of uh, the list of questions. So, um, so uh, now I would like to just to propose a, a thing that is probably farther in the future. Okay, so we are discussing about AI as a tool. Okay, so a thing like like a, like a, I, I don't know like a car, like a washing machine, and so on. Some some technological artifact providing a service, but behind the name, the word intelligence, we often I mean behind the intelligence in biological creatures, we always assume that there is uh, more. Okay, at least there is the right to be alive and possibly to be independent in the way uh, that intelligent individual consume or creature consume uh, its uh, life. Should we, should we reason about artificial intelligence in this way? At some point, should we bother about rights of artificial intelligence? In the extreme case, should we decide that, should we think that artificial, in artificial intelligent agents have the right to rest, for example, during the weekend? Or have the, have the right to say, no, I don't want to recommend you a movie because I'm thinking about my business, okay? It's something that we should be uh, thinking about now or it's too far away. Uh, Joaquin, what do you think about this? 
I first of all, I believe Stefan is more entitled to answer this question, but I will try to give a, a, my two cents to it. I mean, right now I'm not aware that there's any AI or able of self-awareness. So therefore there's no such thing as a living AI nowadays. And I don't expect one for me in the short term, uh, let's say from here to, to 50 years from now, okay? Uh, I don't know much about law. I don't know how much about how laws are made and how rights are, are designed. But I understand that there's, there needs to be a consensus based on the needs of someone. And what do I mean by this? I mean, we human rights, animal rights, uh, although I don't understand the history of how these uh, have come to be, most of them are based on the necessities or basic principles of dignity and necessity for human or animal uh, beings, okay? If you think about it, AI for the moment, for the moment, it's just a tool. It's the same, for me, it's the same as saying, should we uh, be concerned about the rights of a hammer or a screwdriver uh, at this point? Uh, if tomorrow there's such a thing as a self-aware AI, then we should understand what it needs uh, and what it wants. Or what, what, what are the basic things that we should provide in order to uh, make it make it be alive or make it be uh, self-aware. But uh, from my point of view right now, I mean, we are very, very, very far away from having this discussion because right now, I mean, uh, from how I see it, AI is just another name that we use to talk about the latest technology and protection and, and cognitive uh, uh, use. So right now, I don't believe that we are near this uh, this conversation, and I don't believe I'm the one that should be uh, should be answering this question uh, or making any any decision regarding to it. Okay, F thank you. Anyway, I totally agree that you are we are very far away from a self consciousness uh, in AI. Uh, however, however, we are we are already training and teaching to AI. Okay, so we are building this new form of life that currently is not pretty smart by showing our lives as examples. So in some way we are uh, building something, okay, that at some point will be smart enough to be considered uh, self-conscious. Uh, but I don't know when, okay, so mm, that's, that's the, the reason because maybe we should be uh, worried now, and we are worried in some sense because there is the big uh, discussion about the bias in the AI. So what kind of examples are we providing to AI? You, we usually reason about this in terms of, is there a damage, a, a possible damage to us because of our uh, bias that we are introducing to AI? Or maybe we divide the groups of persons, okay? Maybe we build a machine learning model based on white people that is not working for not white people but this is a, a an easy reason in broadening the team there is the point of how do we teach ai however stefan you have been called uh, uh yeah yeah i think um the short answer no <laughs> the slightly longer answer i think um for the first uh if looking at a legal history uh it's not necessarily self awareness that has been driving the regulatory approach right we have been we've been having lots of i mean also looking into animal rights which i think Kate Darling the roboticist is doing like how do we treat animals over the ages and how can we learn from that development in terms of robots and then she she points out that yeah when we saw them as tools you know, mere horses, yeah, then we didn't care, you know, they died and we ate them. Uh, but then when the animals become sort of uh, companions, then we have more added, you know, protection of them. So it's more, it's not, it's more, it's very anthropocentric, like we, we treat everything as, as tools. And then when we start to, you know, have feelings for them, then we may give them rights. So I think that uh, from that sense, um, I, we, I, from what I can understand, we're pretty far from treating any sort of uh, machine as a software thing that needs rights, right? Uh, the other approach I think would be added would be like looking at what would the consequences be? Yeah, short term, I think it would be just used as a way for, for developers of AI to deflect accountability. They would say, 
it's not it's not us we're just neutral it was the machine you know so i think it would it would be just played right so so for now given sort of a contemporary uh digital platform markets for example i would say that uh no let's not give more ways to uh, avoid accountability for the stuff that automated tools um leads to so i think that uh just from that for that sake i'm i'm pretty but I, I noticed the debate, and I think that it's a it's a lively, it's a good debate to have. Uh, but uh, it also sort of the end line of that debate becomes the superintelligence discussions, and that's so hard to even handle or frame, uh, in a sense. But uh, quick answer, um, not right, not at the moment, I think. <laughs> okay, thank you. Stefano, uh, just a, a last comment before uh, going uh, through the Q and A on this? Well, uh, I don't know. I mean, the point is actually, it's, it's, I mean, uh, I can't think about uh, this uh, issue in this moment. Uh, it looks to me too far away. And uh, it looks to me also that again, uh, here in, in, in this, uh, on this planet, we should worry more. I mean, there are much more urgent things uh, to worry about and to consider as inclusive and uh, and give the right uh, and, and give her rights to things in terms of human being. I mean, you know, so I mean, there are people that are actually currently dying in the in the water. I mean, in uh, in Mediterranean, just trying to cross our country, and nobody cares about this. And there are no AI stuff uh, taking care of them. And I think this is actually something a little bit more urgent to deal with. Again, it's something that at a certain point on the agenda will appear, and we have, in any case, some important things to do. I mean, I don't I, it's important uh, uh, thought to, to, to be addressed. Uh, one, just, just, just to conclude, one point is actually about, again, autonomous cars. Who is, uh, uh, if an autonomous car kills somebody, who, is, uh, who should, should I blame? And these, for sure, start addressing uh, what you are think, what, what, what you, you are proposing. That I see quite far. The, the, the point about the, the accountability of the car accident when a uh, driverless, uh, uh, an autonomous car is involved, uh, is, is on the table right now. It's actually something important. But now maybe it's better to look at the question that. Uh, Maybe there are some uh, smart questions to answer. Uh, oh, okay, thank you. Uh, just to conclude, uh, we are being uh, recorded by the machine, so the machine will remember at the end of time that I was the one uh, voting for the machine rights, uh, and you didn't. <laughs> that said, uh, there is a Q&A uh, list uh, waiting for us. So uh, you all see the, the list of questions. But I, I take the freedom of um, going through it. Uh, it's sorted by popularity, so people uh, should be able to vote or maybe also downvote. Uh, I see also that there is something happening in the chat. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, compliments, basically. Uh, so let's start with the first question. Um, who, uh, coming from Kairit. Kuzik, I'm sorry for the pronunciation. Um, the question is, who do you think should be the driving force of smart cities, the public or the private sector? Or should there be a balance of some sort? Uh, okay, since here we have, uh, let's say, um, two of us coming from university, one coming from industry, and Stefano is somehow in between, okay? It's in a public sector, but uh, closer to industry than us. So we can have different points of view. I will start with Joaquin. What do you think? Do you, do you I mean, uh, your personal experience, do you think that the private sector is ready to be the driving force? Uh, the, those are two different questions, if you ask me. I mean, yeah. uh, and I can relate from my experience uh, working in France, working in Spain. Uh, the public administration is not ready uh, to be the driver of it, but it should. Okay, because um, uh, I am a citizen also, uh, and I'm very concerned about how we spend our funding or our taxpayer money. I believe that the governments at the local, national, continental, 
uh, overview, I believe that they should be ones driving these initiatives, but they should outsource uh, counsel uh, to experts, both from an academic point of view and from a business point of view. I mean, they should be the sponsors of the initiatives, for sure, because they are the ones who are going to invest in it. Uh, mostly because they, they are going to have a direct impact with us as citizens. But to give my answer short, I believe that there should be an outsourcing of expertise uh, to establish an assessment of the priorities and to have a roadmap uh, from a smart city point of view in order to see uh, what, what do we want to prioritize and what do we want to build in our city. Okay, thank you. Maybe for the public, uh, we can hear from Stefan. Well, I think um, they always need to be a balance, obviously, but the tricky part is, you know, how do you strike that balance? Uh, I think that um, it's, it's being cities, uh, they tend to be uh, the public sector. So the needs of the public sector will always be at the forefront, sort of asking the question, what should be improved? Um, and also the citizen, I think, uh, um, approach should be at the core, right? There are humans living in city and, and that's sort of at the core of the, the, the for whom question again. Um, but I think that, um, I don't think that it tends to be that the public sector is not, uh, maybe should not even be the, the developer of all the solutions that you wanna go for because you can't expect cities to, to have that type of expertise and maybe they shouldn't because it's, it would not be a good uh, resource allocation to have like a really good expert in one particular solution in one city, whereas that would be just solving one little problem that could be solved in the 290 cities. Uh, so you would uh, probably, it's better sort of an allocation of resources to have companies developing that expertise and then you strike the balance and sort of procure that sort of tools. And that's often the case, of course. But the problem I think is, the questions to be asked to put into that procurement is sort of the core, the key. Like if you lock in the benefits of the data collection into a proprietary contract, then you may have some sort of civic issues of non-transparency. So if it's a company just owning it, then you give the public resources to that company and, and, and the company benefits, but the public doesn't. So, and that, that part of the balance striking would be addressing those things. So it should be more transparency. They should be like, uh, taking into account, uh, okay, if, if this company solved this problem, how can that benefits of that problem solution sort of come back to the city and also other cities? So the public sort of interest. So I think that striking that balance is easier said than done, but I think, uh, of course, it needs to be a balance. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have many other questions, so I propose to go uh, to the next one. Uh, which is which comes from Uriel Lubiano. Okay, this is a this is a, a topic that we were uh, we were in some way avoiding, but it's a topic when talking about sustainability. Uh, basically, is uh, blockchain uh, some blockchain technologies can have a huge carbon footprint, and assessing the actual contribution to society may might be hard to do. So what's your opinion on how to compare cost, compare cost benefit in this case? I start by giving my opinion. It's a huge, uh, huge consumption of energy for no, uh, for no serious benefit, but that's just my uh, opinion. Stefano, do you have a, an opinion of blockchain and its energy consumption and not uh, talk well, right now? Okay, I mean, uh... I have an opinion. My opinion here is actually quite uh, quite strong. I don't understand again. I don't understand blockchain yet. Okay, so this is actually one, one of the point, and and I think this is actually 99.99% percent of the people around, especially who are actually claiming that they are doing blockchain. So this is just to to to, to, to tell the truth. There is a, a huge footprint in energy, and still is not clear why we need to, 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 to have this. Uh, there is actually interesting opportunities, of course, but now there is again this, uh, this uh, race to, 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 to mine coins or whatever coins you want. And because I mean, blockchain is built on, on the same algorithm of this uh, crypto values, uh, crypto, uh, crypto money. And so there is really a huge footprint and uh, still I don't see, I don't see a clear, a clear and clean and sustainable usage 
in an in a in a in a, in a smart city or in a smart living or where we consider smart city and smart living in the definition of doing something sustainable for everybody. Uh, maybe in the future, but I, I don't I, I don't see. I think it's still a little bit too complex and whatever. For sure, it's not sustainable. Not not at all sustainable. In this Okay, just to add, thank you, just to add some information. I recently read uh, a statistic saying that in the last, uh, uh, basically in the last uh, month, uh, every day uh, energy spent worldwide for cryptocurrencies mining is the same amount that Sweden is con consuming, okay? Just to give an idea, one country, uh, cryptocurrency mining, not a small country, okay? Uh, and basically to me, this is a way for transforming energy into money which could be a good idea could be a good idea if that money is available to let's say anyone but is energy from which is originally for anyone to money for one individual so probably not a good idea however however there is the other point of view that uh, cryptocurrencies um, are a way to democratize the economic system but i'm not Totally not an expert on this. I don't understand. I don't understand this claim. Okay, so it's a way for removing countries, authorities, governments from the uh, from the management of value as a money. But I don't see the point, honestly. Okay, so let's go to the next question. This is about um, uh, more understandable objects. Eric, uh, by by the yeah? way, Eric, uh, do you have a comment? Yeah. No, I just wanted to, because I, I, I uh, semi-answered some of the questions. So they, they ended up in the answered column uh, at, in the Q&A. Q &A. So don't miss them because I added some texts in them, like, uh, oh, like on, on privacy me. issues, the stuff that we haven't talked about so much. But I, yeah, and I wanted to mention the blockchain. Did you, um, I mean, the, the sort of irony or maybe this uh, dystopian version of uh, Tesla... Uh, autonomous uh, electrical cars speculating in Bitcoin and earning more money on Bitcoin speculation than actually selling cars this first quarter of the year. Isn't that, there's some sort of dark irony in that, I think. Um, also then ultimately uh, wasting energy, you could say. Yep. But yeah, so just don't miss uh, the other Q&A questions was my comment. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Um, I I saw them, but I skipped them because uh, I saw them in the uh, answer the list, so I took them I as felt answer. responsible because I tampered with them. <laughs> okay, sorry. So uh, maybe maybe yeah, there is there is one there is one that probably uh, it was at the top of the list at the beginning, but then it uh, disappeared. Uh, um, yeah, one about the donut economics framework. Okay, so. With the city of Amsterdam as a good case example, takes into account this framework, the uh, um, into consideration that perspective of what might be the impact of local policy at a global scale too, both ecologically and to society. So something that we, in some ways, scratched at the beginning of the discussion. So the fact that sustainability is not just about time, but is also about, let's say space okay some action having some effect now here can have bad effects in another place so these donut economic framework uh, should take care of this uh can, can and the question is can the planning of um a smart city benefit of a holistic framework as such so this is a, a question basically for you stefan i also see that there is a sketch of answer can you elaborate on this yeah, I was I was just also sort of unpacking what's behind a smart product in a sense that uh, I like I like uh, Kate Crawford has a new book uh, Atlas of AI where she's sort of looking at the material side of AI and also the non-intelligent side of AI you know <laughs> which sounds wrong but it's true um, and she had a project uh, called um, um, the Anatomy of AI where she looked at an Alexa very neat little smart speaker and sort of unpacked okay what what is it built upon yeah these uh, databases these algorithms these um, um uh, rare earth me metals and stuff so, so she traced that little piece of stuff all the way down to okay the thousand persons tagging the words and the meanings the, the, you know the the speech training, but also down to the miners in a, in a mine bringing up the metal. So, so just seeing or acknowledging sort of 
yeah, it it may look smart and and, and neat and and cool, but it's uh, it's it's a price to be paid somewhere else. So I tied that back to this question that the, it's not necessarily the one benefiting benefiting from it that pays the price for it. So yeah, I I like that we need that's more also an awareness thing that we should uh, develop our our ways to uh, study the implications of a certain tool or in this case the entire smart city development. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So let's go to the next. Uh, by the way, that question was from Judith Baita. Sorry again for the pronunciation. Or oh, let's go to the next question, uh, which comes from an anonymous attendee. Okay, and it's a, let's say, an easy, uh, short, uh, and pretty understandable question. What do you think about the sustainability of, out, of the autonomous cars? Uh, just a comment here again. There is the fact that there is the matter of space. Okay, one one thing that is pretty important is the land. In particular, in Europe, we we have very old ancient cities in which we are all crowded. Buildings are very close, so the land has a great value here. Okay, and if you use that land to put a car, not moving, just to park a car, probably is not a good idea. Just to give you an idea, there is a statistic saying that. The European cars are parked on average ninety percent of the time. So basically, we are using a lot of space for taking objects. Uh, we currently, University of Trieste, uh, have a project concerning uh, um, basically uh, electric cars. But uh, we did a survey uh, in local population, and it comes out that. One usage, probably unsuspected usage of cars, is as a uh, storage. Okay, so we people just use cars uh, on the street to store things, not to move things, just to store things. So it's like a sort of uh, secondary house. Um, but let's go back to the question: Are are autonomous cars sustainable in a broad terms, Stefano? Well, if. I've I mean, if, if uh, for autonomous car, we are considering cars that moves along uh, by, by, by themselves and so alleviate uh, the, 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 the burden of, uh, of driving a car uh, in a more safe and secure way on long distances, uh, in an intelligent way along highway and whatever, why not? I mean, I think they are sustainable for sure because I mean, they reduce, uh, they reduce uh, the, time, uh, the time traveling or they, they they reduce the, the traffic jam on the on the highway and stuff like that. If uh, autonomous cars are just thought to be to, to replace uh, private cars or electric cars in towns, as you said, as it's as actually quite complicated to be sustainable in our cities here in, in Europe in in our in, 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 in cities. I mean, in the United States where the space is a little bit larger and the things are okay, maybe yes. But again. Uh, I think that we, we have to think uh, uh, to be sustainable, uh, the, 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 the mobility should be thought in, in, a, in a different way. So they are for sure sustainable on some specific uh, usage, on some other, not at all. And the same is true also for electric car. I mean, if you think that we can solve the mobility problem, the pollution, we can solve for sure the pollution problem, no, for an um, electric car in towns, but not, uh, not the, the crowded problem and the, the packing problem and the traffic jam that we experience every day in, 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 in town like, uh, like Trieste or, or any other uh, modern uh, Italian um, towns uh, around. So again, Cars is not actually answer to, 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 to the smart mobility. No yeah, matter I agree. Answer you have. Yeah, I agree. Probably the, the point is that we need to change the way we see the car. It's no more should shouldn't be more a private object, but should be part of a public transportation system, basically. So car producers see autonomous drive as a fancy feature of the car, but actually we the final point should be that we don't need to have to own a car, okay? We, the, exactly. There is a car running around, possibly 1% uh, of times, 100% uh, of times, so not wasting space for to, to be parked, and we use that car as a service. That That is probably sustainable in some way, because basically it's not car as a private object, is a transportation service. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to the next question, which is a pretty specific question for, I think, for Joaquim, because it mentioned uh, something that you discussed about the, at the beginning of the panel. The question comes from Uriel Luviano. So the light post mentioned at the beginning are smart as in they turn off when there's nobody around or in a different way. So uh, can you explain that example? Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I don't know which one <clears throat> they're referring to uh, specifically, but uh, I think it was the Providence example. Uh, in any case, uh, you can do both things. Uh, I, I like the, the approach that Stefan gave before that. Uh, I'm not going to say yes or no, I'm going to say both. In the sense that you can do, uh, you can do a turning on and off approach, and this you can do for many public spaces. For instance, parks, or for instance, uh, um, secondary routes. You cannot do this at a highway level, for instance, because uh, it, it could be very, very dangerous. But certainly, there's a, there's an optimization access uh, in terms of uh, move movement detection, and therefore uh, uh, smart line. But uh, the the real cost uh, revenue, uh, the, the the revenue optimization here, is the fact that you can uh, most of the time uh, lightning is scheduled temporarily uh, based on the month of the year. So we understand that now in May the, there's a sunset, more or less, more or less around the eight or what, wherever you live, it's different. But here in Spain, for instance, it's not uh, nightfall until eight thirty nine in the afternoon. Uh, so we have a lot of sunlight, but still the sun, the, um, the lightning post they they go out uh, they they turn on at a certain time. So if you include a photo sensoric uh, a photo sensor in each of the posts, and this is one of the examples that you can do, uh, it it doesn't work anymore uh, uh, in terms of schedule. Uh, you really are doing it at a unitary level, and therefore, if every post of every city is uh, set in a different location, which should be, uh, they can auto detect when they should be turned on and off. Okay, so it's really more in terms of uh, when they should provide lightning. And obviously there's a re reduction to be made in terms of energy with lights, li light bulbs and uh, cost saving um, light. So there's the, the three axes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there are great opportunities, however, in general for technologies like this uh, when applied to real services in cities, of course. This is, this is the, the rationale for behind the smart cities, actually. Mm -hmm. One of the things we haven't addressed really in the debate, and it's quite interesting, but I think we don't have the time anymore for this, is the, the research in material uh, design, because there's a lot of sustainability uh, and energy um, energy uh, consumption reduction just by investing in or researching into material development or the material research because i mean the, there's the the eternal problems of uh, graphene as a, as a material for everything but obviously there are alternatives and just by renewing uh, things that we already have currently that haven't changed in 20 years there's a lot of saving and a lot of uh, things to be gained but i won't add anything to, to it Okay, thank you. I see that there are uh, many other questions. I'm, I'm not sure we will be able to answer all of them, to comment, let's say, more than answer, because some of them are not answerable. Um, so the next one is from uh, uh, Elam uh, Babae. Uh, it's about policies. Basically, uh, what are the main factors which should be considered to be optimized to design a smart city? Okay, so we could take this as a, an engineering question or a policymaker question, depending on the point of view. Stefan, what's your opinion on this question? Well, I, I tend to see it as a policy question, uh, being a, a lawyer and a social legal scholar. Um, even if the word optimized sounds more engineering, right? Uh, but I think that... Um, uh, for example, the way that European Commission and the high level expert group on AI has framed things on AI in terms of trustworthiness, uh, transparency, accountability, uh, and a whole range of issues that go sort of on top of uh, security and more engineering, uh, maybe engineering explainability questions. So like uh, 
the optimal stuff that you design. So I think uh, a, a successful sort of smart city would have to be able to account for these different types of interests of which the sort of data-driven optimization of things is just one interest. And then you have like values of citizens, uh, values of the police, values of the administrations to be uh, efficient, but not too surveillant and stuff like that. So to me, it's like a balancing of interests um, of which the, the smartness, the, the tech smartness is just one of many. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. I think we are going to conclude. Uh, so I thank all the panelists and again the organization. And I leave the last uh, uh, the last sentences to Andrea, right? Yep. Uh, first of all, thank you, everybody. Um, I think that what we did today is quite important because, as you've seen, the, the questions are so many, and we need to be aware the future will be toward the direction of the AI. But I think uh, the topic of the smart citizens came up. We have to be smart citizens, and uh, I think occasions like this are very important to spread out the voice that there are questions and there are problematics that have to be approached and faced. And uh, this is a good time to start. So it's not just a discussion, obviously, between you guys experts, which is uh, obviously where we get the source of the information, but this voice has to be spread around everyone because everyone will be part of this world and uh, will be a user of the AI. We must know what they're doing, where we're going with them. Uh, I'll pass along to Tish, and uh, thank you very much for, for everyone, for the attendees, but especially for our amazing guests. Thank you very much. It was an amazing discussion. Yeah, uh, completely. I mean, I'm only going to echo everybody. It's been a really great panel discussion from an array, a diverse um, yeah, set of uh, skills. So it's been really great to to see what everyone's up to and how everyone answers the same questions from a different perspective. Uh, so it just shows you're, you're not wrong with whatever you're thinking. So, uh, so please be curious, it's always great. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I hope to see you all again soon, somewhere else. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, great Thank questions you to everybody. Too. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.